All right, welcome back. Um, we are going to pick up where we left off last time, last time. Um, so I recorded the Q&A session. Well, I was asked a lot of questions actually. I just got asked the question about how would you go about uh, constructing the uh, McLaurin series for tangent? Um, and I answered that in a Q&A session, which I recorded separately. So we're just going to pick up with where we left off last time and jump right back into it. So without further ado, uh, so last time we saw these facts here. So I mentioned that there were some power series that uh, you guys had to have memorized. So this is just something you need to know right off the bat that the function 1 over 1 minus x is the series of x to the n, n goes from 0 to infinity. This actually works only if your x is less than 1 in absolute values. Um, e to the x is the series of x to the n over n factorial as n goes from 0 to infinity. This actually works for all real x. Its radius of convergence was infinity, and integral of convergence was the entire real line. Uh, these two also work for all real x, and it's saying that the cosine of x is the series blah, 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 sine of x is a series, blah, blah, blah. These are things that you should have memorized. You should know them off the bat, off the top of your head. Um, that was mentioned. Now, I don't remember if I alluded to this, but uh, what does it even mean to say a function is equal to a Taylor series? So we know that this was a formula to find the Taylor series of a function. But here I actually wrote down e to the x equals this, cosine x equals that, sine x equals this, 1 over 1 minus x equals that. Now this one we knew just because it was a geometric series, this guy's a geometric series, but these guys we developed them using uh, Taylor series methods, right? But then I said e to the x is this, cosine x is that, sine of x is that. What does that even mean? Uh, is it always true that a function is equal to the Taylor series that I developed from the function itself? Right? So if I, this is, you might recall that this is the definition of the Taylor series of a function f of x centered at the point x naught. Uh, f of x has to be infinitely differentiable and it has to be the case that its derivatives don't get too large, meaning once I plug in this formula into the ratio test, I get something less than one. So the idea is if, you, if a function is nicely behaved, I can develop this series here. And now the question is, uh, this we kind of figured out, well, if we pretend we could write this guy as a power series, this would be one way to do it. Now the question is, does that always actually work? Does it actually always make sense to say that the function is equal to its power series or its Taylor series? Um, and in this case, these guys were the Maclaurin series, these guys were Taylor series expanded around zero specific. Okay, so now we're going to look at the idea of convergence of Taylor series. We're going to look at when would it make sense to write down such an equation, what does it even mean, and what could go wrong. I'm also going to talk about some examples of, uh, well, that kind of spoils it all, I guess. Um, there are things that could go wrong besides f not being infinitely differentiable and this series actually diverging. But uh, I digress. Let's actually just jump into it and talk about that. I have a Zoom version running for the class, but it's kind of at a weird time, so don't really expect anyone to join me, but just in case I have the, the laptop running here on Zoom. I'm actually recording it on Zoom as well. We'll see if anyone shows up. Totally, it's not even, Today is not even the actual day for the class, so I'm not even expecting anyone to have time to show up, but hey, one can hope that I'm not going to be here all by my lonesome all the time. Um, so I'm actually recording tomorrow's lecture right now. Let's get back into it. Focus up. It's kind of late, so my focus starts to wane after a certain point. Um, so uh, yeah, we're going to talk about convergence of Taylor series. Talk about when is it okay to do something like this, say a function is equal to its Taylor series? By the way, for these it is okay, uh, but it just hasn't been justified. So, for this whole discussion here, it's going to be somewhat theoretical, 
it's not going to be something I'm going to really test you guys on specifically um, or really even expect you to know this in detail. But I do want you guys to get a gist of the kind of things I'm going to be talking about now uh, because these are ideas that there will come a point in your mathematical journey, probably, uh, if you go far enough into math, where so certain knowledge would be expected of you if you've ever dealt with series, and among them would be uh, the knowledge that I'm going to share right now. So, uh, convergence of Taylor series. What does it mean for a Taylor series? Well, we know that a Taylor series is definitely going to converge. It's a power series. So it'll either converge on one point, it'll converge uh, for all points in some open interval of finite length where the endpoints, it might may or may not work there, or it might converge on the entire real line. But uh, let's actually get more specific to what that guy would converge to. Uh, so first some terminology. that we use is big P sub n of x, and it is the series. It is not going to be an infinite series, though. It is going to be a finite one. Uh, let's say k goes from 0 up to n of, essentially, is the Taylor series formula. But it only goes up to the nth power for the x's. So this is called the nth degree Taylor polynomial. Um, one way you can think about this is it's actually just the partial, it's a partial sum of a Taylor series. It's the n plus first partial sum, because this guy is going to have n plus one terms in it. Um, so can write this down. So that, that's the definition. But you can think of this as, well, you can write out some terms f to the 0 of x0 plus f prime of x0 times x minus x0 over 1 factorial plus f double prime at x0 x minus x0 squared over 2 factorial plus dot 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 and it goes up to the nth derivative x minus x naught to the nth power over n factorial. So it's just a polynomial of degree n, where the coefficients of the polynomial come from the Taylor series. This is called a Taylor polynomial. Uh, this will have n plus 1 terms, and it is called the nth uh, degree Taylor polynomial. It's really just the n plus first partial sum of the Taylor series for a function. So, uh, example, if f of x equals e to the x, then the fifth degree Taylor polynomial is going to be, well, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x4 over 4 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. 
because we know that e to the x is the series of x to the n over n factorial. So it's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial x cubed over 3 factorial x squared over 4 factorial x 5 over 5 factorial x 6 over 6 factorial, et cetera, going on forever. But if I talk about the fifth degree Taylor polynomial, I stop it at the fifth uh, power. Notice that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 terms here. Another way of thinking of the n Taylor polynomial is just the n plus first uh, partial sum of the Taylor series. So this is just uh, for the Maclaurin series. This is centered at uh, x naught equals 0. Um, here's another terminology. the nth remainder term. So we're going to talk about the remainder term, which uh, is actually reminds you of something that we had before when we were talking about series. We spoke about the remainder term, which is just the tail, the guy after the partial sums. Well, it's a very similar definition here. The nth remainder term is, well, it's given by big R sub n. And it is, uh, well, the series, and it starts from k equals n plus 1 uh, to infinity of f to the k derivative evaluated x naught over k factorial x minus x naught to the k. Now, notice that this, the Taylor polynomial, goes all the way up to the nth. Uh, power, this guy is just starts at the n plus first power and he continues. So, uh, that is we can write a Taylor series as, uh, well, the series n goes from 0 to infinity of f to the n evaluated at x naught, x minus over n factorial. I can write this as the n degree Taylor polynomial plus the remainder term. That is just to say and I'm not writing out anything new here, I'm just uh, fleshing it out a little bit. Uh, so you can have a Taylor series. so tired. Right on the chalkboard. It's nicer and I prefer it, but it actually is a lot more tiring than writing on a whiteboard. Uh, 
plus dot, dot, dot. So this actually goes on forever. It is going from n equals zero to infinity. And basically, everything I just said is basically to tell you that this first part here, right up to the nth uh, power, this is uh, Pn of x. It is the nth Taylor polynomial. And everything after that, uh, so starting from the n plus first term and going on forever, uh, this is the nth remainder term. Okay, so that's the, uh, the terminology that we're using. self-explanatory at this point. Okay, now some more uh, theoretical stuff. Uh, let's focus on this guy for a second. Let's focus on the remainder term. I want to tell you some facts about the remainder term because knowing about that is actually going to help us talk about what it means for a Taylor series to converge to something. Uh, facts about the remainder term. Now your textbooks gives a lot of facts. Uh, I don't want to give you all of them, uh, but there are some important ones I wanted to mention. Uh, from a theoretical standpoint, it's probably some things that you would want to know. I'll probably go a little bit out of order of the text as well. So, yeah, I think starting with Taylor's formula would be nice. Okay. So there's a theorem. It's called Taylor's formula. And Taylor, the same mathematician after whom the Taylor series is named after, came up with a formula that would describe the remainder term. And it actually looks like one of the terms of the Taylor series it's just that it's evaluated at some specific point. There is a point that you can find where it will actually work out. You can write the infinite list of terms as essentially one term using Taylor's formula. So, uh, with the above notation, I, I don't want to copy that down again. Okay. And under the same situation. So f is infinitely differentiable, all that good stuff. Right? So all that is, is set up again. Okay? Um, then uh, we can actually write down the remainder term. as uh, f to the n plus first derivative evaluated at some point c uh, times x minus x naught to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. So the n plus first term, there is actually a point c that you can plug into the derivative such that um, that infinite number of terms would be equal to this single term uh, for C in, well, it's on some uh, region surrounding X naught. So assume these assumptions on this interval, uh, X naught minus a little bit, X naught plus a little bit, Assuming that I can have my function infinitely differentiable on this interval, and I can plug in x values, and it's going to the derivative will make sense on this interval, all that good stuff. Um, it turns out that the remainder term 
for the Taylor series of the function can be uh, is equal to literally one such term that has this form, um, but uh, there's a specific number that lives somewhere in this interval that you'd have to plug into the derivative to get it to equal the infinite, the tail of infinite length. So that's called Taylor's formula, this guy here. It's saying that the remainder term is expressible in this form. That's Taylor's term. Okay. So the remainder term, it just it starts off with a term that looks like f to the n plus 1, x naught, blah, 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 and then it keeps going forever. It turns out there's a specific number that you can plug into this term that is going to equal to that entire tail, the remainder term, as I de derived it, defined it before. Um, so that's Taylor's formula. That's one fact. It's an important fact, kind of something that you'd be expected to know after being talking about series. Now, the next important fact that I want to mention, so take a snapshot of this. Pause, three, two, one, pause. Next important fact is also named after Taylor. It is called, uh, so this is important fact number two. Uh, it's called Taylor's inequality. And so this is kind of reminiscent of when we were talking about approximating integrals uh, using numerical methods, how you can approximate what the infinite number of terms are doing uh, by using a finite terms in Simpson's rule or Taylor's rule or blah, blah, blah. And we said, if we could bound the derivative, uh, we could actually use this form to talk about the error. There's something that's going to be very similar to that here. It's called Taylor's inequality. So basically, again, same notation and assumptions as above. If the absolute, if the magnitude of the second derivative is less than or equal to some m, m is just a positive real number, for on some integral, for uh, x minus x naught less than d, right? So again, that's an interval that ranges between x naught minus d to x naught plus d, it's just an interval. So suppose you're on that interval, the same interval that was mentioned in Taylor's uh, theorem, uh, Taylor's formula. And you can find an upper bound for the derivative on that uh, interval where m greater than 0 is a real number. Then, uh, it turns out, and this is going to be somewhat obvious, the magnitude of your remainder term will also be bounded, um, and it will be bounded specifically by big N, absolute value x minus x naught to the N plus 1 over N plus 1. This guy is called Taylor's inequality. It basically is an inequality that bounds the remainder term. Um, now, remember the remainder term was the n plus first derivative at a specific point uh, of parentheses x minus x naught to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Basically, this is saying if your n plus first derivative is bounded, there's a number that's bigger than it for all values, including that c value that I mentioned earlier, then you can replace that number here put absolute values around the x minus x naught. This is just going to be out the output of, a, it would just give you a positive real number output, and it actually gives you an upper bound on uh, the remainder term. Now, why is that nice? Recall
that this is something that we mentioned a long, long time ago. If the absolute value of a sequence approaches zero, then the original sequence will approach zero. Now, I'm going to tell you why that uh, this, uh, coupled with this, is actually a very important thing to actually know, um, because that's, it's another fact about remainder term. And it's another theorem. So the third fact, and it's also a theorem. I don't, I don't think it has a name though, a specific name. Um, but the theorem says the following. Again, the same kind of assumptions as above. Uh, if the remainder term approaches zero as n approaches infinity, then the Taylor series Converges to f of x, meaning that function that I started with taking all the derivatives and actually plugging in numbers and computing this whole thing and creating the series, the function that I used to generate this Taylor series, the Taylor series is actually going to converge to that function. And in this case, We write f of x is equal to the Taylor series. When this thing happens, is when I'm allowed to say this function equals the Taylor series. And we said it with 1 over 1 minus x, we said it with e to the x, we said it with sine of x, we said it with cosine of x, and that's because their remainder terms actually approach zero as you go off to infinity. Those aren't, that's actually not so bad to see. Uh, if you look at e to the x um, when x equals zero, uh, then its derivative is always bounded above by 1. Sine and cosine as well, their derivatives are always bounded above by 1. So I can actually pick m equals 1 here and actually deal with them. Um, for other points, if we're not at x equals 0, we can pick something else. But yeah, it's easy to find an upper bound for those guys on um, pretty much any interval. And so it's bounded above by this number, uh, and it's actually going to be this expression will actually approach zero as n goes off to infinity, which means the remainder term approaches zero. And basically that means as you start making the degree of the Taylor polynomial bigger, right? So once you start making the tail smaller, you take more and more terms, uh, the remainder term is going off to zero. What that means is eventually the f becomes that infinite polynomial, which is just like in aggregate. Right? You start writing down that infinite polynomial, the more terms you write down, the closer you get to the function. Uh, and you can write f is equal to this. And if you could, in theory, write down all infinite terms, it will be exactly the same as writing down the function. And this equal sign is meant, under these conditions, of course, this equal sign is literally meant to be equal, meaning the function and the series are exactly the same thing. They're one and the same. It's just another way of expressing the function. So when I write down, um, this happens for, well, one over one minus x to say that it is the series of x of the n as n goes from zero to infinity, uh, provided that x is less than one. It's true for e to the x, x to the n over n factorial, and goes from zero to infinity. It's true for cosine of x, um, minus one to the n, x to the two n over t 
to n factorial. Uh, it's true and goes from zero to infinity. Uh, it's true for sine of x. n goes from zero to infinity. Minus one to the n x to the two n plus one over two n plus one factorial. It's actually true for all of these. In other words, uh, the remainder terms of all of these guys on this interval approaches zero as n approaches infinity. What that means is that this, the function on the left, the the series on the right will converge to the function on the left. Meaning these guys are bona fide, le legit equal. They are the, exactly the same thing. This is just another way of writing cosine. This is another way of writing e to the x. This is another way to think of the sine of x. It's two, it's two different ways. You can look at these notations as two different ways to write the same thing. In the same way that writing 1 plus 1 is the same as writing 2. They're exactly the same thing. 1 plus 1 equals 2. You say that when they're both exactly the same. And this is true for these series and for a lot of other series that we like to look at as well. Um, this series is that function. Anything you can do with this function, you can do with the series. You can graph this. What is its graph going to look like? It's going to look like the graph of e to the x. I can find e squared. One way to look at e squared is just plug in x equals 2 over there. 2 to the n over n factorial. If I add up all those infinite terms, they sum up to e squared. Right? So that's how you can have all these weird things like... Uh, the sum of 1 over n squared adding up to pi squared over, or, over 6, or the sum of the alternating harmonic was minus ln 2, things of that sort. This kind of tells you how those things kind of come about, or like what's going on in the background. Now sometimes you can have all these infinite sums and we can know what they add up to. Well, one idea is we can know this from the Taylor series. So that's very nice, it's very important, it's actually very useful. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, so I'm not going to do a lot of applications today, if at all, because we're actually coming up on the 30 minute mark here. Um, but uh, this makes it useful. The fact that we can think of a function as a series is going to be very useful for us. Now, are there any other facts I wanted to tell you? I'm going to tell you what the Taylor problem is, what the remainder term is, what Taylor's formula is, what Taylor's inequality is, and the fact that when the remainder term approaches zero, uh, the Taylor series converges to the function. And you can literally write them as equal. You can think of them as one is the same. Uh, plugging in a value over there is the same as plugging in a value over there. Uh, sketching that graph is the same as sketching the graph of this series. Everything is the same. Um, yeah, so... I guess what I can do now is talk about some examples. Because one thing you would have undoubtedly have noticed is that throughout Calc 1 and throughout Calc 2 up until this point, all the functions we've actually seen are kind of nice. Uh, they are the kinds of functions that you can differentiate forever. And the derivatives would behave nicely. However, this is not always the case. Uh, so I want to just throw out some examples out there uh, just to satisfy curiosity if some of you might wonder. Well, when would a Taylor series not work out? How many ways could it not work out? Um, what could go wrong? <laughs> Let's talk about that. I'm going to give you some specific examples uh, of some things that could go wrong uh, with Taylor series or with us developing a Taylor series based on some function. Um, here's an example. This is an example of a function that looks pretty innocent, but this does not have a Taylor series. Or 
More specifically, it does not have a McLaurin series. Well, why not? Well, of course we all know what absolute value means, and we can write the piecewise definition for it. We can take all derivatives and do all that good stuff. Um, so you should be able to actually find a bunch of derivatives for this. But if I were to find the Maclaurin series, I would have to evaluate these derivatives at the point x equals 0, where x equals 0. And you would notice here that if you take, well, f of 0, you get 0. If you take f prime of 0, you would get some constant times the absolute value of x squared. Plug in that, you get 0. Uh, take the second derivative. You'll get some constant times the absolute value of x. Uh, you plug in 0, you'll get 0. Now, the thing is, what is the third derivative at 0? Actually, does not exist. Which kind of means that all derivatives after that aren't going to exist, because what are you taking derivatives of? Um, so, uh, to actually find the derivative at 0, it actually does not exist. Meaning, this guy is not infinitely differentiable at 0 there comes a point where you can only differentiate a finite number of times. And of course, now, you can come up with other examples for yourself uh, of other functions that will only be differentiable for a set number of times, but no more. Right? So a function is possible for you to be able to differentiate it a million times, but the one million and first time, it's not going to work out. It's not going to be defined at a point that you care about. Right? So this is an example of something that does not have a Taylor series. And it's not that complicated a function, actually. You're just cubing the absolute value function. Um, yeah. Third derivative onwards doesn't exist, which means that n equals 0 to infinity thing, that's gone. It's more like just n equals 0 to 2. You can talk about a second degree Taylor polynomial for this, but you can't talk about the Taylor series in general. So this one, one thing could go wrong is you can actually not have a Taylor series at all, being able to actually create one for a function because the derivatives just aren't there. It's not infinitely differentiable. So that's one example of something that could go wrong. Now, uh, here is something that, so this is just a non-starter. But there are times when we could get somewhere, but it doesn't take us anywhere at all useful. Um, so another example in which you might find some cure for your curiosity. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you a specific function here because we don't really have the language for it. Um, uh, definition for the kind of function I'm going to talk about would be very complicated and would probably also involve the gamma function, which you've probably never heard of up to this point. Um, but when you get to a class like differential equations, um, there will be a good point to actually mention this function, uh, even though sometimes even then you won't actually see it. A lot of you won't see such a function unless you become math majors and you're at the level of differential equations or higher. Um, but if you do differential equations, it might be mentioned. Uh, the gamma function, um, which is, looks like this guy. And it's actually defined in terms of an improper integral with the exponential function. But uh, there are functions with the property that I'm about to write down. It's just it won't make sense for me to actually write down a formula for you. So let's find a function so that if I take its nth derivative, evaluate it at 0, it will actually give me a factorial. Okay. Which means it's infinitely differentiable. I will always be able to find a derivative. So the zero derivative evaluated at zero is one. The first derivative evaluated at zero is one. The second derivative evaluated at zero is four. The third derivative evaluated at 0 is 36, and so on and so forth, right? So I'm just having a bunch of derivatives that they're, the derivatives are growing like this. Then the Taylor series for f 
is the series of n factorial squared over n factorial times x to the n, or more specifically, the Maclaurin series. Which is the series, n goes from 0 to infinity, of n factorial x to the n. And what you'll notice for this guy, if you actually throw it into, uh, do a series test on this guy, this diverges. Unless, uh, x equals 0. So those derivatives, they get too big, right? So actually finding the derivatives aren't a problem, but the derivatives, they grow too large. Such that if I were to throw this in uh, like a, the ratio test, right? You would have n plus 1 factorial divided by n factorial. That would give you n plus 1, would simplify to. And then no matter what your x is, take the limit as n approaches infinity, that goes to infinity. So this guy will diverge by the uh, ratio test. Now, the only way to stop it from diverging is to actually plug in the value x equals 0. That will mean that it will converge only for one point, which we had a theorem that tells you. It's possible that a power series can converge for one point, for all points on the real line, or for all points in some interval of finite length that's centered at some specific point. Um, so this one diverges unless x equals 0. So this series will only actually make sense for such a function if you're at the specific point, x equals 0. But once you move away from 0, it doesn't make sense anymore, which is thoroughly useless. That's not even, both from an, uh, a practical application standpoint and a theoretical standpoint, this guy is useless. The only thing that this guy is useful for is as an example of something being useless. That's kind of all it actually really is. Um, so, yeah. So, here's a situation where we could find derivatives, but uh, it only converges for a point. Now, here is a final example that I'm going to give you, and it's a very famous one as well. If you go to Math Stack Exchange or any math forum and you ask the question like, can you give me an example of a function that whose Taylor series works out fine, but it doesn't converge to the function? Right, this is going to be one of the examples that you're going to see, example like, pretty much exactly this example, or something very similar to it. Sometimes they don't use the square. But uh, here's an example. Uh, f of x equals, so here's the function, e to the minus 1 over x squared. Sometimes you use 1 over x, but it'll, it'll make the, the details a little bit different, but kind of the same thing is going to happen. Um, of course, your x cannot be 0 there, because you divide by 0 in the power. So. When x is 0, you redefine it as 0. Now, this function is actually continuous for all real x, and in fact, it is differentiable for all real x. Of course, you'd have to differentiate it in a piecewise fashion, and then you'd have to take a limit as x approaches 0, and then using L'Hopital's rule, but you'll be able to find the derivative ultimately. Um, so this function, by the way, looks like... Uh, So it has a horizontal asymptote that occurs around e to the minus 1. And then is this the is this the right graph I'm thinking? I'm pretty sure this is the graph. It goes down. Passes through zero and it grows back up slowly. I think the asymptote is one. Maybe that's what I'm missing. Of, but I'm very easy tired. So normally this would be undefined at the origin, but it is defined to be zero at the origin, so we fill this guy in. Um, but that's what the function looks like. As x goes off to infinity, this goes off to e to the 0, which is 1. So it actually approaches 1. Now as x approaches 0, this approaches minus infinity. So you have e to the minus infinity, which approaches 0. So the closer x gets to 0, the closer that, that this thing gets to 0. But it can never actually be at 0. So that 0, just fill that in. So that's our function.
Um, now, the thing is, if you were to try to find the Taylor series to this function, specifically the Maclaurin series, now it turns out everything will be hunky dory for a while. Uh, we can find a we can find a Maclaurin series for this. And it will converge for all x, right? So the last time we found a Maclaurin series for the function, but it only converged for x equals 0. Here, we, it's possible to find a Maclaurin series that will convert for all x's on the real line. Here's the thing, though. But it turns out that your nth derivative evaluated at 0 for this function is always going to be zero. This means it's Maclaurin, it's Mac series, is just the series of zero. Now I'm leaving out the details here because we don't have time and it's, it will probably be a nice exercise for you to do it yourself. But basically what I'm saying is the Taylor series, if I were to plot that as a function, it will just be the zero function. So that's the Maclaurin series here. And this is the original function here. Which as you can see, it might be a good approximation if I'm super close to zero. But the moment I go away from zero, the series and the function don't match at all. Uh, so this Maclaurin series does converge for all x. However, it converges to the zero function. It does not converge to the original function. So it's possible that the Maclaurin series can work out. It can work out nicely, and this can be true for a Taylor series in general. You can work out the Taylor series. You can infinitely differentiate something. You can plug in values, and you can get convergence for all real x's. But still, at the end of the day, it's possible for the series not to add up to the original function that generated the series in the first place. So that's something that you would want to uh, consider. Although we won't be in this situation a lot. Um, but yeah, just uh, some examples of what could go wrong. And pretty much everything I mentioned up to this point is very theoretical. And I'm not really going to test you on it. But it's one of those things that's kind of something that you're expected to have an idea about if you ever did a class, like a calculus class that actually went through series. So I um, thought I'd tell you about those. So Taylor series don't always work out. And sometimes when they work out, uh, they do not converge to the thing you use to create them in the first place, which is a real bummer. However, when Taylor series do work out, oh my god, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful when a Taylor series works out. By works out, meaning the function I use to create the Taylor series, the Taylor series then actually converges to the function. The more terms I add from the series, the closer and closer it gets to the function, to the point where I can say the function is equal to its Taylor series. Like I can say that they're one and the same. Um, and when that ever happens, it's a beautiful thing because there are many contexts in which dealing with the series is a lot easier than dealing with the function itself. Speaking of which, uh, we can talk about some applications. Uh, so that's, I believe that's the next thing I wanted to talk about. Is there anything I wanted to mention after that? Yeah, no. So I'm going to talk about a few cool things here. Uh, Bring me to the next topic, applications of Taylor series. And I'm specifically talking about ones that, that converge to their generating function. Now, uh, I mentioned this before, but series are widely applicable. They are so useful for so many things other than just calculus and the things that you use for calculus. Um, 
and Taylor series or just power series in general are also widely useful for run a lot of things outside of just calculus class, but uh, we'll focus on just three applications here. So for this class, I want to talk about, and this is the perhaps the most important one, the one that I would test you on, uh, evaluating non-elementary integrals, right? Which we kind of did something like that before, but we're going to do it a lot more generally now. Uh, we did like the integral from 0 to 1 of x over 1 plus x to the ninth dx, and we used the fact that we could write 1 over 1 minus x as a series to kind of talk about that series, that integral. And it turns out that one was okay. We could do it by hand. It would just be very, very hard. Now I'm going to talk about non-elementary integrals, meaning uh, ones that you can't do by, hard, by hand. Not because they're hard, but it's literally impossible to actually write it down in the language of functions that you would have up to this point. It's impossible for you to write it down in elementary functions as they were defined in calculus one, right? So it's not a polynomial, a trig function, an inverse trig, a logarithm, an exponential, or a rational function, or a radical function. Um, so you can write it down as one of those or any combination of one of those. Uh, so these are called non-elementary functions and you can have non-elementary integrals. Integrals that are impossible for you to do. Like the integral of e to the x squared, right? Can't think of a function uh, that when you differentiate it, you get e to the x squared. Or the integral of, say, sine of x squared. You can't come up with a function that when you differentiate, you would get sine of x squared. Um, so, etc. So, really bad guys like that, or not bad guys, just difficult guys to deal with in the traditional sense. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, probably after this, is some like Euler's equation slash Euler's identity. Um, so this is an equation that says basically e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. That has all sorts of applications. Uh, specifically, uh, if you plug in theta equals the angle pi, you can derive the equation e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0, um, which is thought of by many as the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics. If you were to Google, what is the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics? A lot of the websites that you will find will list this as number one. Um, so it's a very important equation. A lot of people geek out about it. It's actually very useful. Of course, in the general form, it's way more useful than at this particular form, but it's, this is a very useful equation, and it gives rise to one of the most uh, beautiful, not most applicable or most useful, the most beautiful <laughs> equation in all of mathematics. Um, and the third thing I would want to talk about in this space is Another look at the binomial theorem. So the binomial theorem is a theorem that tells us how to expand binomials, which means if you have a sum of two things raised to the nth power, uh, how do you actually expand that as a polynomial? So uh, it turns out that you can know exactly what this is. It's k goes from 0 to n of n choose k. I'll talk about what that means next time x to the n minus k, y to the k. And if you write out the series, that's actually what the expansion would look like. Uh, we'll generalize this. Because traditionally, n is considered to be a positive integer, like x plus y all squared. You can get, it's going to be x squared plus 2xy plus y squared by using this formula, and so on. x plus y all cubed. x plus y to the 10th power. Right? But we're going to generalize it to non-integer powers. So if we have x plus y to the 1 half. So students who like to expand 
the radical of 1 plus x squared, and they write down 1 plus x is their answer, which is very bad, very wrong. Uh, I'm going to show you how wrong that actually is. We're going to look at how to expand a radical, uh, a sum under a radical as well, by generalizing binomial theorem. How much time do we have left? Darn it. We're out of time. Time flies when you're having fun. Maybe I'm also moving a little bit slower. Uh, let's actually get with uh, the first problem. Let me actually write down the example that we're going to start next time. So, uh, this is an example of that, it's really a fair example for an exam, uh, so it is a kind of problem that I expect you to know how to do. So, for next time. One, A, find a Maclaurin series for sine of 2x squared. E, estimate the integral from 0 to 1 over 10 of sine of 2x squared as a sum of two fractions. You need not simplify them. I want you to figure out how good your approximation is. Uh, give with explanation an upper bound for the error of your estimate. That's the problem. Uh, it's a really nice problem in the sense that uh, I could ask you something like this on a final. To, like a problem like this. This would be one of the problems on the final. Um, two. Repeat one with e to the minus x squared, and the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus x squared. Meaning, find a Maclaurin series for that, do this integral. Approximate it as a sum of two fractions, and tell me how good your approximation is by bounding your error, how far you can be from the answer. Three, try to prove others' identity e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. Uh, hint, use Maclaurin series. Um, here, i is the imaginary unit. Think of it as the square root of minus 1. And, yeah. So, uh, try that for next time. Um, in terms of today, as I mentioned, a lot of it was theoretical, just me introducing new terms, me telling you about what it means for a power series to converge. Very important stuff to know, especially for future classes, although I'm not going to test you directly on it. Something like this would be something I would directly test you on, ask you a question like this. Um, because the Maclaurin series for this guy will actually converge to that guy. We can use it to help us evaluate that integral, and we can know how good an approximation our integral is if we use the Maclaurin series. Um, so, we will stop there. I will see you in the next one. Ciao.